This episode is brought to you by Vortex. On social media and on shooting forums, you will see comments like these all the time. My fill-in-the-blank rifle name here will shoot half MOA groups all day. Or it's a one-inch gun, as long as I do my part. And after all, what is the internet really for if not bragging and exaggerating? But there's a consequence to all of this. Many folks these days are focusing on shooting tiny groups. And to get these small group sizes, that often means looking only at three shots at a time. Sometimes the more dedicated shooters will knock out five shot groups. But as our shooting editor, John Snow, will explain in this podcast, that is simply not enough rounds. That's not enough data to make good inferences from. And even more problematic, because we're only shooting these three shot groups and analyzing them all individually, our rifles are not zeroed properly. Yes, I'm even talking about your beloved half MOA gun. I'm Editor-in-Chief Alex Robinson, and in today's podcast, Jon Snow will attempt to open your eyes to a whole new way of looking at rifle accuracy. We will talk about compiling 20-shot groups and 50-shot groups and explain what that data can teach you about your rifle. John, before we dive headfirst into the deep weeds of rifle accuracy, um, can you just explain broadly what you and staff writer Tyler Friel have been working on just in terms of figuring out how to better analyze rifle accuracy? Because you you and Tyler have been working on this for months now, um, and I, I just want to kind of get in broad strokes captured uh, what you guys have found out. Well, you know, what we found out is that the way we've gone about testing rifles in the past, which really was and, and still is sort of a gold standard level of, of, of assessment in the industry using multiple five shot groups and lots of them and lots of different types of ammo. What we found is that looking at individual groups, whether they're three shots or five shots really isn't enough. And that what we've needed to do is figure out a way to pool the data so that the groups aren't just sort of individual events that we then look at and measure, but that we can actually combine the groups together. And it gives a much more valid read on, on a, how a rifle system is performing and it's the accuracy of a given load and, and so forth. So that's, you know, and this has been a journey we've been on for in some ways, almost like a year and a half, but it's really kind of crystallized in the last half year. Okay. Uh, I think my role in this whole conversation is just going to be trying to accurately describe what you say, but in in a very simple way. Because some of the stuff you guys are onto here, onto here, like requires some math, which is not my strong suit, and I'm guessing for a lot of listeners, like not really what they're interested in either. But I think there is there's a really uh, imp- there's some important takeaways here you know, some really useful information, even just for like your everyday rifle hunter, you know, just your deer hunter, for example. So before we get into the math, give me the takeaway. Like, what am I going to get for, for, you know, learning about this kind of new way of assessing rifle accuracy? Okay. okay. No, good, good, good question. All right. Well, let, let me, let me tell you a story. Let me paint you a picture, if you will. Okay. Yeah. And this is, this is straight out of my history and experience. And I think it's, but I think it's fairly relatable with other people, you know, back in the day, you know, before deer season, I would head to the range with my brother or a buddy or something. You know, I had my Ruger 30 out six that was, you know, kind of my fancy rifle. And I had my lever gun too. And, you know, I would set up at the bench and, you know, shoot a three shot group and wonder, you know, did my zero shift from last year or so, so on and so forth, you know, and then of course, you know, shoot my three shot group, let the barrel cool down while my brother would shoot his. And then we kind of look at the group and say, oh boy, well, gosh, the, the center of that group needs to come, you know, over this amount and down this amount and, and, you know, make those adjustments on the scope. And then I'm going to shoot a couple shots to confirm, shoot one shot, maybe two, and and they aren't really at the center of that group either. All of a sudden, now I'm like, oh, damn, man, is my barrel heating up or whatever else? So c- kind of engage in this process a little bit of shooting, adjusting, shooting, adjusting. 
And, you know, by the end of a range session, I, I would be chasing holes around on the paper with my zero, trying to get it dialed in perfectly and ultimately chasing my tail, right? I mean, I'd leave the range. I might've shot 12, 15, 20 times a box. And I kind of know where my gun was shooting, but it wasn't really what I was setting out to do to really zero it. So I do all that work and not really leave the range in any of the wiser. You know, I'm probably good enough to deer hunt, like in fairness, but just sort of having those kind of nagging doubts. And, you know, it turns out that if I had just approached that shooting session in a different way, I could have left with a much more accurate and solid idea of how the gun shoots. Okay. That does sound promising. I'm in for that. Tell me the better way. Explain explain how to do this. I don't know, just just more efficiently in a way to get like real data. Okay. What what this what this is and here's here's some of the mathy part, but I think it's pretty easy math even even for, you know, sort of a standard kind of knuckle dragger is that you know, in order for us to to say that something's valid, we have to do it a certain number of times or see a certain number of outcomes. And if each shot is a data point, the fact of the matter is, is that three data points or five just isn't enough, just with the way statistics work. You know, you, you think about, think about shooting a shotgun and imagine if, you know, somehow all, all you had was one pellet striking the paper when you go to pattern it. Well, I mean, God, that yeah. pellet could be anywhere in that whole thing. And it might be up into the left and you'd be like, oh my God, my thing isn't zeroed. But if you repeat that one process with the 200 pellets, all of a sudden this pattern emerges with the density in the center. We're, we're basically doing a variation of that. So what, what it is we want to do is we still want to shoot our groups, whether it's three shots or five, doesn't matter, but we do not touch the scope. Do not touch that dial, as they say, in between the groups. Okay. <laughs> and so we have, you know, a same kind of reference point. So, you know, we might have a target with, like a number of aiming points on it. And as long as we're shooting at a consistent aiming point and not touching the scope, what we can then do is um, overlay those groups in a pretty easy way on, on graph paper. It's like a little art project. It's, it's, it's easy. It's, it's even enjoyable. It's kind of fun. And what happens when you overlay that data, all of a sudden that shot, gun pattern like pattern starts to emerge it's really amazing and so if we get to 20 shots you me everybody else is going to have a really good idea one of how the gun actually shoots and two what the actual zero on that rifle is and the reason we're able to do this is because there are some really good tools that are inexpensive to purchase online from Hornaday and Ballistic X and a couple of other providers where you can take a picture of the group or take a picture of the of the little chart that we made, the little plots on a paper, and use the group analysis tool. And basically once you input all of that data, and it's not that much, you input where you were aiming and then you input each shot. And then usually you have to calibrate it so that the app knows what an inch is. If you do those three things, this thing does all the hard math. It'll tell you what the center of your group is. It'll tell you how far across the group is, you know, the extreme spread, the group size. And, you know, that also gives you the correction to actually zero your rifle. So all we had to do was, hmm. was one less thing, which is don't touch the dial. Like, yeah. And, and then at the end of it, you end up with a data set that has validity and then you can make an adjustment and feel comfortable that your rifle is actually now zeroed. Yeah. You're, you're onto a, uh, some, a really important thing that you said is um, the things, the only steps that you kind of have to do differently. If you assume you're already shooting five shot groups, what you have to do differently is just make sure that you're, that you have a consistent aim point on a target for all of your five shot groups and then be able to overlay your targets so that you can have this aggregate of five shot groups that makes a 20 shot group. And then just use these, uh, you know, these simple apps to do the math for you. Right. Exactly. But let me, let me just correct one thing though. 
you don't have to do five shot groups. You can overlay three shot groups. So you can overlay, Hmm. you know, six, three shot groups and then a two shot group to get 20 shots, you know, at that point, seven different names. You can overlay them or you can do four or five shot groups or five, four shot groups, or you could have a target that has 20 individual aiming points and you could put a shot on each one and do the same thing. It doesn't matter the group size. Cause some people are like, well, my gun shoots good three shots, but you know, at five shots, it's going to open up and the barrel heats up and you know, that may or may not be the case. Um, actually, you know, cause you know, we all want our guns to shoot well and, and we will make excuses right. for the guns, you know, Oh, that was a flyer. That was a, this, that was a, that it turns out it, it isn't, that's not a flyer. Like if you had a good trigger pull, that's what the gun does. You know, and so mm. the thing that's really neat is that when you go when you go through this this process, like you know, again for people listening, they're not going to see it, but you can see like this group of five shot groups, and you can see some of them are like little clusters, some of them are kind of lined out or whatever, some of them are left, some of them are right. You know, they're really good groups, they're small groups. You know, but then when you lay them over each other, you get that you get a really dense cluster of overlapping shots and the, and that little cluster of dots is what the app can look at and then tell you, well, here exactly is where you need to move your elevation. Here's where you need to move your windage. And it's just leveraging the power of all the data together rather than looking at the groups individually. The, the one thing it does do is that, you know, the groups are going to be bigger, <laughs> right? You know? Yeah. So, so what you felt yeah. might be a, a half inch gun or an inch gun or whatever probably really isn't. Or the other way to think about it is under what circumstances is it a half inch gun, you know? And yeah, that's been also one of the really fascinating things about this is that it has caused me and Tyler, I know to really look at rifle performance in a very different light. Yeah. I mean, just to, just to talk that out a little bit more, you know, why the, the definition of your rifle might change, you know, if if we're looking, if we're looking at 20 shots and now we're just, let's just look at three shots individually. Let's, let's just do three shot groups and not, not do the big aggregate. There's a good chance that we'll be able to get three shots to all land very close to each other and get that half inch you know, we'll get those three shots to la- land within a half inch of each other if we do it enough times. That that will happen. That, but to do that, we have to throw out all the other shots that we've made because oh, maybe I ah, that that was me. I didn't do my job. Oh, the barrel's hot. You know, we just have to throw out all this other stuff and only look at those three shots and be like, "Yup, it's a half inch gun." And you're saying. All those other shots are also data. They're just as valid as the three shots that we really like that are right next to each other. Exactly. You know, I mean, it's, it's been a maxim of mine for a long time. And, you know, when Tyler and I started working together, you know, I I mean, I told him, don't make excuses for the gun, you know, because we all like, even, Mm -hmm. even though some of the guns we review are, are, you know, they're not our guns, right? We're going to send them back. You know, we want every gun to do well. Oh, we see the potential in it or whatever else. And it's true. I mean, you know, we really, and, and, and it's even more, if it's your gun that you bought, you really want it to do well. You're right. literally invested in it, <laughs> right. right? You know, but the fact is, is that the, the, it's going to do what it's going to do. And you can either sort of with, with an open mind, like take a look at the data and let the data be the data, or you can cherry pick. And ultimately you're not really doing yourself any favors other than maybe to your ego to, to cherry pick the, the data. And The thing that's kind of cool is that, you know, because I've done this exercise and here's one thing that's important to mention. So if we take a rifle and we do this drill with four or five shot groups, and then we repeat it with the three shot groups and get to the same number of shots, you know, the average group size of the five shot groups is going to be much bigger than the three shots. But when we overlay them and we get the 20, you know, shots from the three shots and then that one two shot group at the end and we take the 20 shots they look amazingly similar amazingly similar and it's and it's like time and time again now they're not going to always be exactly the same that's just not how the statistics work but you know i'll get i'll give an example so i've been 
prepping for a uh, upcoming long range match. And I have, I'm shooting with a buddy of mine and I got our barrels. We were running these accuracy international rifles that with that switch swap barrels out. And, you know, he didn't have time to, um, do the barrel break in. So I did the barrel break in for both of us. So I got our two barrels and I would switch groups in between the barrels as I was going through the break in process. But I kind of measured, you know, so I'd shoot a group, clean it, shoot a group, clean it, and kind of do this at intervals. So anyway, I put a hundred rounds through each of these rifles, measuring all the group sizes. And for the last 20 rounds, that was a 20, 20 round group um, or 20 shots without cleaning, you know, so four or five shot groups for each of us. When I measured my four or five shot groups and average them, which is what I would have done before, it was 0.75 inches. Really nice. And his was 0.95 inches, you know, and I would traditionally, I'd look at that and be like, oh, hey, my barrel's shooting better than his. Tough luck. But now I overlay them. And my 20 shot group was 1.30 inches and his was 1.25. His was actually tighter than mine. And I'm like, oh, okay. And again, not by much, just 500s. But then, because we gathered all this data, I, I took a look at all 20 of the groups that we measured. And when I averaged his 20 groups and my 20 groups, they were, the average came out to be exactly the same other than six hundredths of an inch difference. Wow. Yeah. So the the point being is is as that data which is what you would expect there's i'm shooting out of the same rifle same scope same lot of ammo you know these barrels were made at the same time and they were chambered on the same machine i mean these barrels are identical right and so in a perfect world you'd be like well god they should shoot identical and as it turns out they do shoot identical um but if i was to if i was to take a look at the data sets like we would do normally there would be times where like, oh, my rifle's shooting better than his or times where his shooting better than mine. We just weren't shooting enough. Yeah, exactly. And I think like to let's take that even a step farther. You know, some of those false assumptions um, can lead you down a bad path of being like, oh, this barrel's this barrel's better or, oh, my scope isn't sighted in properly or, ah, oh, when my gun heats up, then it starts to walk. So talk about some of that stuff, like how this can kind of save us from chasing bad data or false data. Yeah. I mean, what it does is that it allows us to, to open our eyes to what a, a rifle in this case is actually doing. And we don't have to get strung out about like where we would look at like a five shot group before and, and maybe it was very horizontal. You'd be like, Oh man, you know, my elevation's perfect, but like there was either wind or maybe that's often a sign of trigger control. Maybe my trigger control was bad. Or if it's, or if it's a, a vertical group, be like, Oh, I've got to work on my breathing, you know, and, and do that. And, you mm -hmm. know, you know, you're still having input with the rifle. That's still the case. But when you get, to that 20 shot group and you see that kind of roundish blob, you can actually take comfort in that knowing that that's how it's supposed to look. It's a scatter plot, right? Or around a, a central point of aim of the, of the group. And, you know, so it kind of frees us from thinking about, Oh, my barrel's heating up and walking. Oh, my fundamentals are, are, are garbage. Oh, the wind kicked up. It, it, it washes those things to the side because now we have enough data that we can actually draw some conclusions on this. And, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, the people who have really concretized this are the, are sort of the ballistic team at Hornaday who have been, you know, they've got their own podcast and there is a, a, a great, podcast of theirs called your sample your groups are too small and it meant sample size and you know so th they kind of get into the weeds you know they've they have been um shooting massive data sets and seeing how a lot of these assumptions we'd make or concerns that would be raised about a rifle just wash away and it's changed you know it's helped change my approach to rifles and rifle accuracy you know, and it's also had a spillover effect into hand loading and other things where, you know, the sample sizes needed to be big enough to start to be valid and not to draw false conclusions from small sample sizes. 
We'll be right back after the break. Take your place at the top of the food chain with the updated Viper HD rifle scopes from Vortex. Powerful HD optics deliver more light to your eye to make the most of every moment. Illuminated reticles throughout the line ensure you're ready at first light and last. Hunt your way with multiple configurations, reticles, and turret systems. Stop by your local Shields or visit shields.com slash Vortex to check out the full lineup. I'm going to paint you a picture now. And I know you've seen this. I know you've seen this a bunch of times. I have to. Maybe you've done this. Uh, maybe I have myself. But, uh, okay, you've got your rifle. You've been shooting it all summer. Feeling good about it. You feel like you've got a good zero. You've got your hunting ammo. You're all all good to go on this big hunt that you've got planned. Now you fly or drive to camp, you know, and you get there. And it's, oh, the traditional thing of like, if you travel, you got to shoot your rifle. So everyone goes and, you know, shoots their gun at the camp, you know, at the camp range off the hood of a truck or whatever. (laughs) And maybe that first shot doesn't hit right where you want it to. So you're like, oh, I'll shoot again. And if that second shot doesn't hit right where you want it to, now you're like, oh, my gun, my my scope must have got bumped. Had to have. Now, now all of a sudden we're adjusting, we're changing but on two shots, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And now, you know, it's a guided hunt. The guides are starting to stand back there, arms crossed behind you. And they're like, oh God, I've got to take this guy around. His gun's not sighted in. And it's just, it can create this whole, depending on how much ammo you brought for the hunt, it can create this whole like uh, stressful situation of you thought your gun was sighted in perfectly now you get on this big hunt that you've prepared for and it's not, or you think that it's not. And now you're chasing the zero around, you're tra- chasing holes around the paper. This should help alleviate that, right? 100%. 100%. Because if you've done the work kind of like we're describing, you know, get that 20 shot group with your ammo on paper and you'll see this, this group, this plotted out group. Well, now, you know, you've got this cone of dispersion that the rifle will actually like when you shoot 20 times, that's what it looks like. So if you roll into camp and your, you know, your shot that's supposedly off kilter is in that cone of dispersion, you're fine. You shouldn't touch the thing. Yeah. You know, even if it's an inch this way or an inch that way, you know, I mean, depending on how the rifle shoots. Right. And yeah. You know, of course, you know, you need to check your fasteners, make sure all the screws are tight and everything else. You know, I mean, that's, it's not like that stuff never happens, but that, that scenario you pointed out is, is so relatable. And even for like the, the, you know, you know, forget just kind of rolling into the rudimentary camp and going through that, you know, I'm going to this match later this week. And on, you know, it's, it's the match is Saturday and Sunday. And on Friday, there's going to be kind of a zero confirmation thing. And I guarantee you, there are going to be people who are lying down there at 100 and they put a couple shots down range and all of a sudden their point of zero has shifted, you know, a tenth of a mil. And they're going to start click, 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 you know. And, mm-hmm. you know, I kind of learned and, and with some of my shooting partners, we learned long ago not to pay attention to that. But I don't think we knew, understood why exactly. I mean, we would say it's in the mm. noise is what we'd say. Ah, oh, that's okay. It's just in the noise, not to start to futz with it. But, you know, what we've learned through this kind of this process, again, you know, kind of hats off to the Hornaday guys for sort of revealing it to us. But what we've learned is that, yeah, you know, you're going to have, you know, the bullets aren't all going to go in the same hole. It'd be nice if they did, but they don't, you know. And so yeah. when you roll into camp, and you got that quote unquote shift, you know, I would say, you know, 19 times out of 20, just ignore it unless something's really off. Yeah. So what, I mean, what you trade in ego, you know, you kind of talked before uh, about the, the, you know, the, the three shot groups and, you know, that makes you feel good about your rifle and that's kind of like a bump to your ego, what you're trading there and looking at these 20 shot groups, aggregates is having real confidence in what your rifle does, right? You don't have to, you don't have to try to um, defend it or you don't have to second guess yourself. Like 
because you know that every once in a while your rifle will shoot a bullet, you know, an inch to the left. That happens sometimes. You've seen it in your own data. You know that this isn't some, you know, some issue where now you have to start moving the site around. Yeah, that's that's completely right. That's completely right. You know, there there is, you know, it's it's kind of like a Buddhist enlightenment. You know, you let go of the ego attachment <laughs> and now you can see the world for as it truly is in all of its glory and awfulness. And, you know, that's kind of what we've done with these rifles is we're, we're just viewing them, I think, much more clearly now. And, and actually it is, it's very liberating because, you know, for instance, I just, I just did this, this exercise with um, one of our favorite rifles from the rifle test that seek and slam. And I did a series of five shot yeah. groups with it. And then a series of the three shot groups and my last, you know, the last three shot group was actually a two shot group to get to 20 shots. And those two shots landed right on top of each other. And I, and I was very, and it was interesting, I mean, but they were off to the, they were off to the right a little bit. And I was just thinking about how, like in the past, you know, had I been uh, zeroing my rifle, I did the first three shot group. And if my confirmation shops landed on top of each other like that, I would instantly move the group over. To have that, oh my God, I've got this great zero. They're just stacking it right on the thing. But really what I've done is I've just moved my zero off in the other direction. And then when I go to camp to do the check, all of a sudden that bullet's off to the left. And it's like, well, what happened to my zero? It must have gotten bumped or, you know, it just saves you from all of that yeah. metal gymnastics and anxiety for me. It was made me anxious. Yeah, Absolutely. You know, one of the other things you referenced earlier was uh, the barrels heating up. What have you learned about that uh, in this process? Like what, you know, is that, yeah, just, just what have you learned? What can, what can we take away there? So that, that's a really interesting question. One of the things, and I'll, I'll kind of expand it a little bit. One thing's about these 20 shot groups or a 25 shot group. And let's just talk about that group number. We'll take one step back. 20 shot group still has a, a margin of error in it. Like it's not ironclad. Like okay. if you really wanted ironclad data, you would shoot about 50 shots, but that isn't practical. It's not affordable, you know, and it's probably not what most people want to do. Although if you wanted to go that far, you know, you would have a more ironclad thing. So even at a 20 shot group, if I shoot one 20 shot group with a rifle one day and another 20 shot group with it, another aggregating this data, you know, they're not always, they're not going to be the same. They'll be close, but there's still a margin for error there. Okay. So, you know, that said, with the 20 shot data, because it's close, it, it's not going to be a perfect circle of impacts, right? You'll start to see that really form at 50 shots. At 20 shots, it'll be roundish. It'll be a bit of a blob, or maybe it'll be round. You never know, but it's going to have a blob like quality to it. Okay. And, and here's the point if it's not a blob at 20 shots and it's like, angling up kind of almost like a, like a rectangle on its side or something, or you see some other distinct shape form that actually tells you something is off. And it could be that your barrel's mm. walking. It could be a loose fastener. It could be, you know, you know, in, in some extreme case, if it's a really sensitive lightweight gun, maybe you're shooting it radically different on shots 15 through 20 than you were on shots one through five, you know, you're putting different torque in it. So it's a really good diagnostic tool. And so one of the things I do, and there are a couple of reasons to do this, is for each of the five shot groups I plot on the paper, I use a different color fine point Sharpie, you know, so I can kind of see mm. where the groups are in relation to each other a little bit. And if you really want to see if your rifle walks when it heats up, the way to do it is to dedicate 20 rounds to it. and um, shoot at, you know, basically consistently, you know, a shot every 10 seconds or whatever it is to shoot and record the shot, shoot and record the shot. So you do, you know, 20 shots worth of groups. Again, you could do four shot groups, five shot groups at different points of aim. Cause the thing is, if you do it all on one point of aim, you start to shoot into the group and you can be hard to figure out where right. a shot went. Right. So that's, that's actually why ironically, the more precise your rifle is, the smaller the groups you might want to shoot because, you know, you can right. have something that's like clumping five shots together. Like I had with my accuracy international, 
you know, I had a five shot group where I kind of lost two shots in the group because I couldn't find them. You know, I mean, yeah. they were in there, but I wasn't sure exactly where. Right. You know, but you didn't and, know exactly where. Yeah. Right. So I didn't know quite where exactly to put my dots. Um, so, but yeah, so if you do the 20 shot group and over overlay the groups kind of at a, at a regular interval, you know, 20 shots, a shot every 10 seconds to where the barrel's really going to be hot by the end. Then you can see if your barrel walks, you can compare where those first 10 shots went versus the first fifth last, last 10. Um, but most of the time, again, it's one of those excuses we make, you know, and I heard this from a really good buddy of mine who makes guns for a living. It's like, oh, you know, we send out three shots because my guys, they get all excited when the three shot, you literally said this, they get all excited when the three shots are tight together and then they mess up the last two. And I was like, you know, I'm like, dude, I love you, but you know, I'm thinking to myself, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> you know, I, I'm picturing like these really excited, like shooters that is, you know, you know, it, you know, it's, it's just that you're not shooting enough. And when you shoot more, like you see all this. Yeah. And when, uh, like when you do see a, like a barrel start to walk, as you described, will it, like, will the shots kind of pattern off into a specific direction or will it just like spray all over the place? It, it, it'll, it'll wander off in a specific direction. It'll wander off in a specific direction. Gotcha. Um, you, you'll get a notably non blobby aggregate group. And you will also notice that as the, you know, you know, you go from groups one to four, you know, the, the group of four will be notably in a different position than, than the, at whichever point your barrel starts to walk, you know, those groups will start to kind of shift off. But again, I think, you know, it's less, it's, it's, it's less of an issue than I think we have historically attributed it to. And, and, and again, the other way to test it is to shoot three shot groups and really let the barrel cool in between each or whatever, you know, so that the barrel's never high and just compare the two. You know, and that, that'll also give you an A, B comparison. So if you really want to know if your barrel walks when it gets hot, you know, that's there, those are a couple of ways to do it. Yeah. When, uh, kind of going back to the, the zeroing part, you know, in, in the story that you, you write about this, you know, you, you had a line in there that a lot of us have, uh, have a near zero, I think is what you called it. A Nero. A Nero. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and like that's kind of close. Let's and, and you kind of even alluded to it when when we for my first question of like for some hunting applications that you're that's probably fine. You're going to get by just fine. But at what point does that start to become detrimental to to like field shooting? It's a good question. You know, I mean, if you're uh, you know a Midwest hardwoods hunter, you know those shots are you know maybe rarely 125 yards or something. I mean, just depending. It's, it's not going to make much of a difference, right? I mean, you don't need to, yeah. you don't need to go crazy, but I think the point for me is that again, it goes back to the, 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 the Buddhist like liberation of the enlightenment. It gets rid of the anxiety that I know I felt and you've described, and I think we all nod our head and can relate to when you go to, you know, quote unquote, check your zero before the hunt after having sighted in it and it's somehow off you know and that anxiety like that just that's not good for your your, your you know your mental state it has a big part of how well you shoot right and the last thing you mm. want is any kind of nagging anything about like well god you know is the rifle doing something different like so to to me the issue is this look we're already putting in the work to like kind of check the zero we're already got all of the data points. All we have to do is combine them and we'll get a better view of the gun. And, and in all honesty, well, like I said, 20 shots is kind of what we're, what we've said is the threshold for validity. You know, even if you group 15 shots or 12 shots, you know, you're going to get a better view of the rifle than if you just did three shot groups. Right. So like, let, let's just say you're not buying into all this nonsense that I'm talking about. You know, but the fact of the matter is, is if you just treat your zeroing in a different way where you don't touch the scope until your shooting is done 
and then just do this little analysis, you know, it, it'll give you better information, right? And, and peace of mind. And that's really what it's for. In terms of the practical field application, you know, for anybody who might be taking a longer shot at an animal where you can have compounding errors and stuff, you might be traveling for a big hunt of a lifetime. And again, where all of those anxieties can then get amplified because then you're checking zero and now it really matters. Well, again, this lets you know that maybe you don't have to worry about your zero. And then if you end up with a 350 yard shot on a trophy mule deer, you know, and that's something you've been practicing for and have been told to expect, this process will help you incredibly. It'll help you one again with the peace of mind. It'll help you know what the rifle's doing. It'll help you if you're using any kind of a ballistic solver. You know, there are all these free ballistic apps mm. out there. Um, this gives you better data to stick into those. So there's, you know, there's really no, unless you're just totally lazy and are just like, Hey, I'm on paper at a hundred near the dot, you know, two shots. I'm good. Like, unless, you know, and there are guys that are like that and this isn't for them. Right. But if you're kind of any notch above that, this is pretty easy. You know, once you see it done and it just gives you peace of mind. And, you know, I, th I think for those reasons, it's, it's totally worthwhile. Yeah. For the old, the two shot sight in guys, they've, they've stopped listening to this podcast long ago. They've, they've already, they've already moved on to TikTok or whatever. Yeah. No, they're, 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 they're already drinking <laughs> beers, which, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. And good for them. Last, yeah. last question for you, I think. For folks who want to do this, you know, they, they've listened through, you know, obviously your story will be on online on outdoorlife.com, you know, in there we'll link to the, some of the apps that uh, you mentioned, you know, tools that folks can use to, to do this. What are some other tips um, that you can share with folks who like are, you know, kind of inspired by this and they're like, yeah, I want to get a perfect zero for my hunting rifle. You know, just give some little, little tips that you've discovered along the way doing this yourself. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. So we're going to have links to, um, a target I've designed that kind of facilitates this process. It's a nice little, it's a nice little target. And the, the way it's designed is that it, it, it has some like little points of reference on it that allow you to kind of easily line up the groups over your common aiming point. So, the target, you know, will have a number of circles on it and, you know, you just aim at each circle, you know, for your group. And then when you go to, to overlay them, you know, basically what you do is you poke a little hole through the point you were aiming at and, and, you know, on a clean sheet of paper, a clean target underneath it, add the dots for where the shots hit. And then you poke a hole in the next group at where you were aiming at and you take that hole and you line it up with the hole on the sheet underneath that had the thing. And you just kind of rinse and repeat. And if you use paper of the same size, so, you know, I have these just on standard eight and a half by 11 paper and you use eight and a half by 11 paper underneath it, you know, because the circles are on a grid, actually the paper edges line up really nice. It makes it really, really simple. So that's, you know, that's one little tip to do it, you know, and that, that, that's kind of the idea behind these targets is to, sort of facilitate, um, that, you know, other, other, other things to do are, you know, again, we sort of talked about it. If your rifle is hyper accurate, you know, you it can pay to go to smaller group sizes to overlay them. So you can keep track of your shots, um, using the different color markers for the different groups is not necessary, but I, I find it fascinating to see how the groups relate to each other. But, it, but the other, the other advantage of using the different colors is, is that sometimes you know, the dots start to get so close to each other. It's hard to tell. Is that one dot of blue ink or two? And if mm. one's blue and one's red, you'll be able, even if they're nearly on top of each other, you'll be able to see them better. So it kind of helps with that process um, as well. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of little kind of, you know, t tips and tricks, you know, we've, we've picked up along the way, you know, you don't have to use the targets we've designed, you know, you just have to use something with a common point of aim. Um, oh, the other thing is like all of these, all of these apps, you know, you take a photo of the target and you, you want to take, make an effort to, to have your, you know, your phone, you know, kind of level and parallel to the target. Cause if it's tipped, it, it introduces distortion in there and it'll kind of like, you know, um, 
you know, throw the, the, the circles off a little bit. Um, what else? Oh, you know, these apps are, were originally designed and they work great for like looking at the holes on the target rather than like these little plots of color, these little dots that we're talking about. And so when you set it up, you know, they're, they're set up. It's like, well, pick the size of your bullet. Are you shooting a 30 caliber bullet or a seven mil or whatever? And when you're using the group analysis just on the holes, you know, that makes sense because it allows you to line up that thing. But one of the tricks we found is that if you're, again, your gun shooting tight and you've got a lot of data points, select, like tell the app that you're actually shooting a two, two, three. And what it'll do is it'll allow you to input the data and, and see all of the shots more easily because ultimately the app doesn't care about the outer edge of the, of the bullets. It's, it's, it's calculated based on the center to center. So it doesn't matter if the circle around uh, a two, two, three size circle or a, or a 30 cal circle. So like sometimes if you're having a hard time because things are so tightly clustered, actually dropping down to the, to the smaller diameter size can, can make it a little, a little easier. So, yeah, I mean, there, there are a number of little, you know, kind of like, I mean, I don't even know if they rise to the level of hacks, but you know, these little tips in terms of doing this. And, and I will say, I don't think it sounds complicated, but like as complicated as it sounds like when I describe it, it's that much easier when, when you, when you do it. It, it really is. It really is simple. Yeah. You're basically just making dots through the target that you shot and then analyzing those dots. <laughs> it's pretty exactly. straightforward. Right. I mean, yeah. exa- exactly. I mean, but if I said that, like I would be writing haikus instead of 3000 word articles. So I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Like I said, my yeah, job but, is to, but, to say what you're saying, but, but simpler. <laughs> and there'll be lots of pictures and, and step-by-step stuff in the, in the story. So, um, that, that, that should make it pretty, pretty idiot proof, you know, for, for people to follow along. Nice. Well, John, thank you for this. Uh, I know that I'm going to start shooting this way this summer with my hunting rifles. Like I'm very curious about it. And, um, and I love the idea of just having a zero that I'm like rock solid confident in. So thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Let me know how it goes. The Outdoor Life podcast is edited by Mike Peterson of 85 Audio. It's hosted by our editor-in-chief, Alex Robinson. It's produced by me, executive editor Natalie Krebs. You can read more from shooting editor John B. Snow on this topic at outdoorlife.com slash rifle accuracy. Music in this episode is composed and performed by Pierre Locatelli via APM Music.